This morning, please. The book of Genesis. First book of Moses. Genesis chapter number 4. And verse number 7. Genesis chapter number 4 and verse 7. If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Father, bless your word, your holy name. Amen. You can be seated, and I want you to look very carefully at this verse of Scripture. You have to look at the Scripture very carefully. In verse number 7, it said, If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? Question. If thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door as a crouching wild animal. Note carefully now. He is not speaking to Cain. He's speaking to the animal. And here's what he says. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. In plain words, the power of this crouching animal will rule over Cain. Cain's desire shall be unto sin. Man that is born of woman is a few days. The scripture teaches us that we are sinners, not only by birth, but by choice. Sin is the problem in our streets in America right now. As they walk about screaming and yelling and protesting, these people are not protesters. These people are haters of our country. You have to understand the nature of your enemy. You have to understand the problem. The problem is not black, white, yellow, green, blue. The problem is sin. It's in the human heart. It is in the soul of a man. It's what makes him what he is. So the Word of God starts here in the book of Genesis and it deals with the issue of sin. And the first time it shows up in the Bible, it is as an animal that is going to devour its prey. Some of you probably aren't far right now from that moment when it shall devour you. It may be after your home, it may be after your health, it may be after your job, it may be after your, uh, your reputation. And make no mistake about it, it will not stop until you are absolutely consumed. Sin has an attitude. It is a personality. It's personified in the Bible. And the Bible is the only book on the face of this earth that knows how to deal with the issue of sin. It's not popular in the pulpits today. And my dear friend, you hear very few of these reverends that say anything about sin or hell in America anymore. I've got no more use for them than I have a mad dog. I want to hear some old boy. He may come from behind a plow. He may have on overalls. He may never have been to a Bible college. He may not know the difference between a hole and wow and a commas a tooth. But I'm going to tell you something right now. If he's called of God to preach God's word, then my friend, that's who we need to be listening to. Sin is an issue. In the Old Testament, you have types of sinners. One of them, for example, is Nimrod. He is like the one right now who is running things. Make no mistake about it. It's not these people screaming and yelling in the streets. It's somebody higher up than them. Think about it. you got people that run around in the streets as they do, and the mayors and the governors say it's just fine, let them do as they please. But when it comes to you meeting in the house of God to worship the Lord, no! Shut you down. And now they keep talking about a second wave. Let me tell you something. I don't believe a word they've got to say. I believe they are liars. I do. I believe they are liars. My dear friend, let me tell you something. Listen carefully to me. If these people know so certainly that a second wave is coming, maybe they got something to do with that second wave. You would do well. To remember that they are as Nimrod, who was the first rebel against God, who wanted to create a world religion. Then you've got that type like Jezebel. Jezebel wants to destroy. Just remember, when you're dealing with Jezebel, you are dealing with somebody that will destroy you and then walk and dance on your grave. This world is full of Jezebels. Then you have Gehazi. Who's that? He was the servant of the apostle, of the, apostle, of the prophet. And let me tell you something about him. He coveted. And Gehazi is like so many other people. He, they covet today. 
Covetousness is one of the worst sins of America. They've got to have everything their eyes sees, everything their hands touch. And my dear friend, that's what God Almighty has brought the country down to its knees. And He may keep us there for a while until the covetousness dries up. Then there's Pharaoh. Pharaoh, my friend, is the one who procrastinates. This is the type of the sinner. You've heard the word. You've heard it. You've heard it. You've heard it. You've heard it. God's spoken to you. He's begged with you. He's pleaded with you. And you won't listen. You won't listen. You won't listen. And you say, maybe tomorrow, maybe next week, maybe next month. And that next week, next month never comes and you die in your sins. The Lord said, if you die in your sins where I am, ye cannot come. Sin, my friend, will send you to hell. Pharaoh is a type of the sinner. The Bible teaches us about the nature of sin. What is the nature of sin, preacher? It is deceitful. You believe a lie. If you're a sinner, you're believing a lie. You think you understand what's happening. You're in control of your life. But your thinking faculties are being affected by sin. And you can't control it. It'll control you. You have no power over it. It has power over you. You're nothing in the world more than fodder for a cannon. My friend, sin will destroy you. It is deceitful, but it's pleasurable. People aren't tormenting themselves when they run drunk and they fornicate and they bed hop. My friend, they do that and they run to the bars and they fill them up. And that's okay with this crowd. But to come to the house of God and preach His Word, it's not okay with this crowd. My friend, let me tell you something. I am so sick and tired of politicians that think they're God. And they try to shut down the church of the living God. Amen. I may wind up in jail, but that's just fine with me. For I don't have that much time left in this world anyway. And I want to go out the right way. Amen. Standing for the truth. Sin hardens. Some of you are so hard to the Word of God that you think I'm crazy today. Nobody's going to tell you what to do. Nobody's going to bark and preach and scream at you. You hear that back from people today. Don't preach to me, they say. You need to be preached to. I mean, look what's happening in this country. Sin blinds. Some of you are very religious people. You belong to the culture of religion. The culture of Christianity. Everybody in Knoxville and everybody in East Tennessee and everybody in the South is saved. No, they're not. That's cultural Christianity. Have you ever personally come to the Lord Jesus Christ and believed on Him? Asked Him into your heart? Trusted Him with your soul? Have you ever done that? If not, you're a cultural Christian. The nature of sin is like the leper. The leper, my dear friend, is a living death. It's a dying death. It's dying every day. I don't have anything on the face of this earth that's worse than leprosy when it comes to that. You're dying, 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 and dying. Your body's falling apart. Your body's rotting. Leprosy, as they say in the Bible, unclean, unclean, unclean. You live in the midst of people that are truly unclean. This is a filthy filthy culture that you belong to today. I've watched it as it's died before my eyes. When I was a boy, things were entirely different than they are now. Truth is, I'm surprised that people will even let you preach to them anymore because we live in a filthy world. We live in a filthy society. God help this place. Amen. It is filthy. The nature of sin, therefore, is deceitful, pleasurable, hardening, blinding like a leper. The filth that goes with it. What are the consequences of sin? Samson gives us one of them. He was put into the pit and he would ground and he was grinding and he ground and he grinded. Day in and day out he went around and around and around. Why? Because he played with Delilah. He had his time with Delilah. And Delilah learned his secret. And when she did, she cut his hair off and she said to Samson who was lying in her bosom, The Philistines are on thee, Samson. He jumped up, the Bible said, and shook himself as he had at other times. It wist not that God had departed from him. Some of you wouldn't know it if God departed from you because you don't know what it is to walk with God. You have no idea what the joy of the Lord is because you've never had the joy of the Lord. 
I don't want to be mean, but I'm going to tell you something. Religion is a substitute for the truth. This, this modern Christianity in this country is a feel-good, shallow religion. The joy of the Lord is your strength. And Samson got up and he shook himself as he did at other times. The Philistines are upon thee, Samson, Delilah cried. And then she stood back and let the Philistines come and drag him off and put him in chains. And he could no longer break the chains. Why? He was no longer walking in the will of God with the power of God. The only hope you have in this world is to stay close to God. It's pray. It's read your Bible. Live for the Lord. Else you're going to get sucked up with this filth and perversion that this country is spiraling downward into. So you mean to me, preacher, don't you think that America is a wonderful place? America could be a much, 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 much better place. But America has sold its birthright. And America is abandoning God. And America is going down, down, down until there's nothing left. Once you see crumbling around your soul and your heart and your mind, everything that you ever thought was decent, and you watch them tear it down, I don't know how much you'll be patriotic then. I was born here in 1946. I put four years in the military. How many did you put in? How much crowd out here walking up and down the streets tearing down things? How much did they serve? What did they ever build? And I served my time. Loved my country, worked in my country, blessed in my country, worked with my hands and was thankful to God that I could. Amen. I didn't ask for a handout. I didn't feel like they should pay me, give me, do for me. I was just thankful to God that I had a hand, two hands, and I could work. And God blessed me, called me to save my soul and called me to preach. And now I watch my country. The one that I see that flag, for four years I served under that flag. If you've never served under that flag, shut your mouth. You've got no business out here walking around in the streets protesting anything. You've never paid your dues. You have no idea what you're doing. And most of them out there, as we talked about in Sunday school, what was July the 4th? What is this about? They don't know. But they know they want to tear down George Washington. What does that say, preacher? It says that there's somebody up here, some mind that's manipulating these poor, ignorant. Did you know the average college graduate today is not even as good as a high school graduate was when I graduated? We do more then than the average college graduate is today. So ignorant. Most of them have a degree that's not worth the paper it's printed on. Amen. That's the truth. It's the consequences of sin. What are they, preacher? Graveyards. How many people in this graveyard right now that could have lived a full life? They could have lived a meaningful life. They could have taken care of their families and fed their kids. They could have been a daddy. They could have been a mother. The most important thing that you'll ever do in this world, if you're saved, is be a good father to your children. Be a good mother to your children. And when you get old, they'll gather around you. And they'll take hold of your hands. And they'll pray with you. And they'll thank God that they had a good mother and a good father. Amen. What's he done? He's destroyed the home. Homes out here, they don't know what a home is. They don't know what a home is. You've got men out here running all over this place that have sired five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, fifteen kids. They don't do a thing for those kids. That's no hero. It's a man that gets up and goes to work. When he's tired, he stays at work. He sacrifices for his children, for his home, does his job, loves his Lord. And his home is so important to him, he'd die for it. That's your hero. Broken families, product of sin. How many children out there right now saying, Daddy, where's Mama? How many children out there right now saying, Mama, where's Daddy? Saddest thing I ever heard, a man said he went to the window. He saw his daddy walking out the street. He saw him go across the top of the hill. His daddy never turned around. His daddy never said a word. 
and he watched him go out of sight, he never saw his daddy again. How'd you live? Where'd you go? Did you do that to your kids? Did you walk out the door and leave your little children there? With their mother, and you never fed them, you never gave them a dime, you didn't put any clothes on back. You ought to hold, you ought to crawl in the hole somewhere. You need to hide yourself because you're a living shame and abomination. Say so that's strong preaching. Well, you're so used to the good, sweet, mushy, mushy stuff. It's every once in a while you need to find out that the the pie's got a crust. <laughs> Amen. I ain't mad at you. I go home. I slept good last night. I had. Well, I really did. One of the best nights that I've had in a long time. You know why? Because I had peace. I knew what I was going to preach the next day. And when I lay my head on my bed tonight, I'll sleep like a baby. And I thank the good Lord for it. My blood pressure didn't shoot up one bit. I'm not even sweating. I'm doing what God's called me to do. If you're mad and you're worked up and you're spitting fire and you're ready to kick a stump and you're ready... To, it's you doing it, not me. Because I'm doing what God called me to do. See, that's the difference. People don't understand. You preachers understand. You know when you're doing what God's called you to do. You know. And if God's laid His hand on you, gentlemen, you do it. You preach. You do what God's called you to do. Deprivation. Hungry kids. The children right now at homes, they don't have anything to eat. Oh, Lord, I'll never forget that little child. They just, they just executed her murderer a few months back. And they said, that, they said that when he would come in, he'd take an old coal can of beans and, and cut the top out of them, an old coal can of beans, and throw them over there at that little child and say, and she said, I'm hungry, Daddy, I'm hungry. He'd throw that at her and say, eat that. And then he wound up killing her, sexually molesting her. And then they... After about 30 or 40 years on death row, I take no pleasure in watching anybody die. But don't be so sympathetic toward him. Amen. Think about that little jerk girl. Amen. That's right. Think about the little girl, the victim. Think about her. Think about her. Think about her. Broken bodies. How many's ever heard of Errol Flynn? Did you know he died when he's 50 years old? Did you know he wrote a book and he said, I want you to publish this after I'm gone. What was it? My wicked, wicked ways. That's what he said. That was the title of his book. He died 50 years old in the arms of his 17-year-old lover. 50 years old, his body was emaciated. 50 years old of the drinking and the smoking and the carousing and the living like hell itself. And he died a young man. My daughter's over 50 years old. He died a young man. That's what sin will do to you. Sin will take you out of this world. Have you ever seen anybody in the hospital with their tongue so big swollen up that they couldn't even get it in their mouth? You ever seen anybody that's just as yellow as they can be with a tongue swollen up that they couldn't get it in their mouth? That's liver failure. What causes liver failure? Drinking! Alcohol! Liquor! Liver failure. You ever been in the hospital and deal with somebody who said, Preacher, play for me, pray, pray, pray for me, pray. Preacher, I've got, in, I've, got, I've got infection around my heart and they're going to do surgery. If, if God doesn't heal this, they're going to have to do surgery on my heart. And so I took them by the hand and I prayed with them. And I said, Lord, have mercy, be merciful and gracious and heal this heart. And you know what? The heart got healed. Ask any doctor, ask any doctor, ask any doctor if drugs can cause your heart to become infected. And if he's half a doctor, he'll say, yes, they can. They can cause your heart to become infected, which of course can lead to all kinds of heart problems and even death itself. Yes, broken bodies. My wicked, wicked ways. I wonder if Mr. Flynn were here today, what he might have to say to us. I have no idea. I'm not his judge. I'm not God. I'm just the preacher. But I do know this. God is not mocked. Amen. It's not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. If you shake your fist in the face of God and scream at him and say, nobody's going to tell me what to do. I'm going to do my thing. There ain't no God. I dare you to challenge him. You atheist out there, you think you're an, you think you're an atheist. Challenge him. 
Challenge him one time. You'll leave there shaking and quivering. You'll be reduced to what you are, just a little passing, flimsy human being. If that almighty being comes upon your soul, he can reduce you so quickly to nothing. I don't shake my fist in his hand, face. I raise my hand. I say, I love you, Lord. And I don't bow. I don't bow to any political movements going on out here with the mob. I bow to God Almighty. That's the only one I'm going to bow to. I bow to Him. Well, we know all the consequences. So what's the remedy? Well, let me give you some types of it. Across the Red Sea, the wind blew, the ocean opened, and it dried up the ground. And they walked across on dry ground. What's that? That's the Holy Ghost making a way where there is no way. If you want to come to God, if you think that you're, if you think that there are so many obstacles between you and the Lord, so many things that you got to get straightened up, so many people in your way, you've done too much. Let me tell you something. If you seek after Him, He will take every obstacle out of your way and He'll make a clear path straight to Him. If you get serious today about God, He will meet you wherever you want to meet Him. Amen. We use, we use excuses. Then there's the walls of Jericho. That's a type of salvation. The remedy for sin. Did you know that Jericho is a cursed city? Did you know that? The Bible said, He that layeth the foundation of Jericho will lay it in his firstborn. It's a cursed city. So when they walked around it seven times, the number of completion, divine completion, perfection, can't get better than that. Well, the number eight's the next one. That's right, and that's Christ's number, 888. They walked around it seven times. What happened to the curse? The curse was broken down. And Rahab, the harlot, the prostitute, those prostitutes that believed the word of God over the religious crowd was delivered. She was delivered. Hallelujah to God, amen. She was delivered. There is the Jonah and the whale. He said, I have the bars. I have the bars. I see the bars. I'm locked up behind bars. Aren't you glad that God can go into a maximum security prison? He can go into your bars of drugs. He can go into your bars of homosexuality. He can go into your bars of sexual perversion. He can go anywhere you are and there make you free. And finally, the year of jubilee. That's the, that's the remedy for sin. What do you mean? Restore, restore, restore. The Old Testament prophesied, Restore the years that the canker worm hath eaten. Restore what's been taken away from me. I've lost my youth. I've lost my health. I've lost my, I've lost my, I've lost my testimony. I've lost my witness. I've lost, I've lost my joy. Lost my hope. Lost my home. Come to Him. He'll give you a new home. He'll give you a new joy. He'll give you a new... He'll, he, yes, He will. He has... The Creator can create daily everything you need. But finally, finished in Christ, that, dear friend, is the remedy for sin. A person. Now, a lot of folks got mad at me for preaching the way I did this morning. I don't care. <laughs> I've been at it too long. I really have. I've been at it too long. I don't care. Maybe it'll help you. I mean, when we were kids, they used to give us cod liver oil. I mean, you remember that. Well, I gave you some cod liver oil this morning. <laughs> I did. I told you the truth. Christ is the only hope you have for your sin. Christ is. You don't need, listen, if you've got counseling and reformation and 12-step and programs and all of that, I'm sure there may be some help somewhere to be found in that stuff, but that's not, going to, that's not your answer. Your answer is Christ. Your answer is the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll close with these three things. There are three big sins in the Bible. Sinning away the day of grace. The Lord said, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. One of the worst things about life is that you think tomorrow will be just like today. You got no hope of that. You, you have no hope of that. 
Nobody knows that. The second big sin is the unpardonable sin. The Lord Jesus said, you're a generation of vipers. These were the people that committed the unpardonable sin. And the third big sin in the New Testament is the sin unto death. And this is for a brother or sister. A sin unto death. What is that sin unto death? A sin that leads to death. It's the sin that God can chasten you for and you won't quit. It's the sin that He deals with your heart and with your soul and says, come back to me and you won't do it. You know you're born again. You know you're saved and you know the Lord. You know Him. You know Him. So there's no excuse. Yet you won't come back to Him. That's sin unto death. That's the sin unto death. That's the sin unto death. It'll lead to death. So what do you mean by that, preacher? I mean God will not let you live a long life in front of unsaved people when you profess to be saved. He'll not let you live a long life in front of them where they can say, well, if he was really born of God, if he was really a Christian, who is God going to judge me? He never did judge him. Why, he's no different between him and me. It's when God takes you out of this world and on your deathbed, if you have an opportunity to say it, you say to that crowd of unbelievers, I deserve what I'm getting. I rebelled. I was hard-hearted. Let me read this for you. Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. I never had looked up that word pleasure before. It's sunu dakeo. What's it mean? It means that you look at what they're doing in their sin and you enjoy it. It gives you something. Just to watch it. You don't have to be doing what they're doing. You enjoy it because you see them doing it. That's perversion. Take pleasure in them that do it. And they know the judgment of God. You're not ignorant. You didn't do it in unbelief. You're not ignorant. Folks. If I were you. I would come down on my knees this morning and say Lord Jesus. That preacher preached the truth to me, and I needed to hear what he said. He preached the truth. I've been running from you for a long time, or I've been following afar off. I've never really drawn close enough to you to really get into your will and know what it is to walk in fellowship with God, but I know I'm saved. Are you there? Is that you? In the name of the Lord, why don't you come down here this morning? You don't have to tell me anything. You don't have to tell anybody anything. Just God. Confess to God. Talk to Him. And come down here today and say, Lord, that preacher preached the truth to me. Maybe it's because of the way I'm living that I've had so much messed up in my life. Maybe you'd like to do that. Heads are bowed. Father, Your Word's been preached. I thank You for it, Lord, and for the opportunity to do it. You've been good to me. You've blessed me. Now, Father, we pray that You bless Your Word. And it will bring forth fruit. It will not return void, but it will accomplish that which you please. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.